try enjoying life rather than spending his time trying to outsmart me. While he's alive, that is. I know what you're saying, but it's not that simple. It's just human nature. What's that guy doing? I wonder. If you haven't heard of Chance the Rapper, here's the short of it. Chance, or Chancellor by birth, hails from West Chatham in Chicago. His father is a politician who currently serves as Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Rahm Emanuel, and had previous experience working with then-Senator Obama. Chance grew up with jazz, hip-hop, and gospel as musical influences, and he had a passion for performing. Though Chance created other mixtapes in high school, most people credit his breakthrough to 10 Day, a 14-track collection inspired by the 10-day suspension he faced for possession of marijuana in his senior year. Chance got some attention from Forbes, Complex, and other outlets, but didn't pick up the meteoric following he has now until he released his next mixtape, Acid Rap. Jody Rosen from the Rolling Stones said the instrumentals had a, quote, woozy, psychedelic feel, end quote. His quirky personality and apt delivery of, quote, thick clusters of rhymes impressed her and many other outlets. The sophomore mixtape charted on Billboard's top hip-hop albums exclusively due to digital downloads. Star-studded collaborations with the likes of Kanye West and Donald Glover led anticipation for Chance's third mixtape to grow to a boiling point. Coloring Book became an instant hit. Although it debuted with a two-week exclusivity deal with Apple Music, the album broke a record being the only album to chart on Billboard 200 with no physical release. Coloring Book featured hits like Angels delivered through a charismatic gospel jazzy hip-hop blend. The release netted him three Grammys, and it should be noted that this is the first time an album without a barcode has received such an honor. While there is no shortage of musicians climbing out of obscurity into fame and fortunes, Chance is on the cutting edge of the modern iteration of being a musician. Before we get too far into that, however, I want to provide a little context for the industrial side of music. Music has taken an interesting journey as an industrial endeavor. There has always been an incentive to monetize the art form. During the 18th century, the primary revenue stream for a composer was the sales of printed sheet music, which could be produced and sold worldwide. The composers had publishers who took care of distribution and legal protection of these pieces of intellectual property, giving us the first example of copyrighted music and the piracy that prompted its creation. With Thomas Edison's invention of the phonograph in 1877, recording live performances became a reality, allowing artists to sell recordings of their work within wax discs or cylinders. For the next 121 years, musicians, and more predominantly record labels, sold sounds as a physical good, using records, cassette tapes, and CDs to make back on their investments. 1998 was the beginning of the end for that medium, however. You may not remember Ritmateca, but its founding and strategic partnerships with the likes of companies such as Universal Music Group and Microsoft set a new precedent for selling music. They offered a digital library of MP3s sold at 99 cents each, or $9.99 an album. The original idea was that users could download their music and burn it onto the CDs they would listen to. The concept was a little ahead of its time, but a little too rooted in it. The company could not get enough capital, and after the dot-com bubble burst, they closed up shop. Record labels played with all of the tools they had at their disposal at this time, trying to sell MP3s on their own online stores, therefore on their own terms. They offered songs at $3.50 a piece, but the person purchasing that song only owned it for a rental period. As you might imagine, that service did not last long. MP3s were being uploaded and shared through a service called Napster, which incited a war between the record labels and those who would provide music outside of a label-friendly ecosystem. Labels had a lot of success in court trying to quell the flame of piracy, but they could not stop the shift of consumer behavior, just alter its course. Shortly after Napster's rise and fall, iTunes was launched, capitalizing on the strategy of Ritmateca at a much more opportune time. Pirating music became more difficult, and purchasing music became much more easy. The convenience of purchasing MP3s coupled with the prevalence of MP3 players like the iPod brought us into a different age of music. iTunes became the highest grossing music vendor in the US in 2008, and the highest grossing in the world by 2010. This reclaimed territory for selling music would be short-lived, however. While iTunes reclaimed the US in 2008, something else was brewing in Sweden. 
A company called Spotify aimed to combat the still rising rates of pirating music by offering a freemium service where users could listen to whatever song they wanted with an ad or a small subscription fee being the only thing that stood between them. Spotify would not arrive in America until 2011, but it was clear that the tide was shifting by 2013 when iTunes saw its first drop in individual song revenue. Other services like YouTube, Beats, and eventually Tidal would also try and carve out their piece of the modern music economy. Apple, taking note of this trend, bought Beats, leveraging their platform to eventually launch Apple Music. While vendors and record labels seemed to be okay with this latest shift in the industry, artists began to try and stand against it. Taylor Swift, previously Spotify's number one artist, pulled all of her work from the platform to take a stand against the lower wages earned by musicians, there as opposed to album sales and digital sales. Adele took a similar strategy, refusing to stream her second album, opting for a strategic partnership with Target to sell a deluxe edition of the album there. Since then, other artists have joined the efforts of Taylor Swift and Adele by advocating for industry change. Although Taylor Swift was able to sway Apple Music's policy on royalty payouts within the first three months, the trend is going to continue outside of her favor. Streaming revenue is rising steadily with new streaming services being introduced frequently. This trend is not just limited to music either, TV and video games are adapting to it as well. With all these changes happening in the way we're able to access and purchase music, record labels, vendors, and artists are all trying to figure out how to keep those changes in the music economy under their control. While most artists are trying to preserve the system that they know, others are embracing the inevitability of these transformations. In 2002, before streaming was a mainstream venture, David Bowie said in an interview that, quote, music is going to be like running water or electricity. He warned artists that the absolute transformation of everything that we ever thought about music would take place within 10 years and that nothing was going to be able to stop it. While Bowie's warning is apocalyptic, Donald Glover, or Childish Gambino as his stage name, thinks that there is a philosophical shift taking place. He said in a 2014 interview with Studio Q that, Yeah, I mean, music is like information. It should be free. It's like it should be free. I believe that. Publishers and record labels originally existed to solve the problem of distribution. Back in the days of sheet music, CDs, and the gramophone, you were limited to a small audience if you didn't have the means to manufacture and sell copies of your work. Now that distribution is virtually unlimited, labels are trying to defend the very problem they originally solved. That brings us back to Chance the Rapper. Like Glover, Chance is embracing these shifts in the industry. As I covered in the opening of the video, Chance is having a very good year. He won three Grammys without selling the music that he won them for, which is again, a first for the history of the Grammys. He prides himself on being independent of any corporate influence and has built his own brand without selling any part of himself. He sells his own tickets, provides his own merchandise, selects the brands he wants to participate with, the artists he wants to collaborate with, as well as the social missions he wants to partake in. While Chance makes money through streaming his music, the majority of his revenue comes from touring, merchandise sales, and the occasional corporate sponsorship. The sales of music, a two-century-old endeavor, has become a tertiary source of income for him. While Taylor Swift and the record labels of the world cling to preserve the traditional means of selling music, a new path is being forged. While the shakeup of the industry bred the career of Chance the Rapper, he is not simply the product of the modern music economy. He's the pioneer of it.